for seven years. My friend Joe Vieira stepped back, um, announced that in December. It was official in May. We're now six months into this little transition time. Uh, transitions, you guys ever, you ever done one of those before? Can, uh, it's gonna be a little, can be a little tricky. Um, and also, like, a lot of fun because uh, even in the uncertainty of what's to come, there is such an opportunity for, like, creativity um, and, like, welcome and invitation, and there are, it's just full of surprises. As I've come to experience it, it's kind of like life all the way. It's like all the content. It's so much of it that it's hard to say, that, you know, good, bad, or other anymore, which is kind of a gift. Um, that's from my perspective. So uh, as far as it goes for us, functionally, organizationally, um, we are pretty stable for the most part, I feel like. I feel pretty stable. You guys feel stable? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but we do have something on the radar that's coming up that, and, and kind of just has to keep being mentioned, and that's that our current lease is a seven-year lease, and it goes through the end of next year. So uh, January 31st, 2024. Our current lease expires as it goes with commercial property. Uh, you want about a year um, uh, to begin the negotiations to renew the lease. And so we're looking at that uh, January. So that's like somehow, you know, it's almost Thanksgiving. Um, so I have a feeling January is going to be here pretty quickly. And where we stand financially is uh, we're about two-thirds, like I, I made a little joke about being you know, two, two and a quarter thirds. Um, it's sort of funded into a place where we would feel very comfortable approaching the landlord, renewing the lease. Um, so that's pretty good. But again, I'm not a fractionologist, but uh, two thirds, it's not quite three thirds. So um, if this place feels like home to you, if it's beginning to feel more, more and more like home, this is just an encouragement to consider investing in that way. Um, my sense of things is that like, we're just getting started here in this theater. Like even in the last six weeks, if I look at the last six weeks and all the different um, functions, that, the different roles this building has played and the, uh, the space that has been able, um, like just in the last six weeks, it's, there have been, there's been a, a political debate held here. It was a building rental. That was pretty tasty. Um, it's been, there's been a memorial service held here. There have been church gatherings held here. Um, it's been a coffee shop. It's been a movie house. When, uh, when schools were canceled this week, we opened it up and played uh, a movie for the kids in the morning. Had a coffee shop. It was a blast. Um, it is a, uh, uh, there's a 12-step program that meets here. Um, and more and more opportunities that seem natural and organic and um, well-fitting continue to present themselves. And what we're finding is the more we open up the building to like a wide variety of people, people that probably wouldn't normally come into a church building, like I guess what we're finding is that there is tremendous benefit um, meeting in a historic space that carries its own natural warmth and beauty and that isn't like a church. It's not a church building. And for whatever reason, that, that, can, that can kind of put us at ease a little bit. Um, so, anyway, I like it here. I'd like to stay. You guys, should we? I like it here. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, so I want to say this too. Uh, baptisms, um, we are going to be uh, baptizing down at the beach next week. And so if you are interested in being baptized and would like to sign up, you can send us an email. Additionally, and also you can just, like, show up next week with a towel. Um, and we would be honored to be uh, a part of that with you. Um, and that's actually what the, the topic of, of today is going to be. The message is going to be around baptism. What, what is it? Why do we do it? Right? What does it mean to be born again? That's spoiler alert. Um... Oh, just so I don't forget, uh, here's some of the, the, the practicalities of next week. So we will have service here. It, it's the, it'll be a third Sunday, so it'll be the donut party there in the morning and the kind of contemplative service happening here in the auditorium. That'll go from 10 to about 1045. 
And then, you know, parking's kind of tricky down in Atlantic Beach. Have you noticed that? Maybe you've noticed that. Uh, they towed my, my ancient Tahoe one time, and I argued up and down with them. And I'd pay $400 to have it released. Heathens, I know. So... I bring that up um, as a cautionary tale and to encourage uh, carpooling, if possible. But we'll all gather here, service is normal, and then we'll head down to the beach uh, for baptisms, and then we're going to have just like a picnic, kind of bring your own food, lunch, uh, on the patio and in the lobby afterwards. We'll have a little celebration. So those are the mechanics of next week. Um, any questions? Clear enough? So let's take, let's take TD, uh, T, <laughs> I don't even know what word I was trying to make there. Let's take three deep breaths together. And in each breath, we will just be welcoming the spirit, welcoming the presence of God, and calming ourselves down. And with each exhale, we'll be exhaling any kind of distraction, diversion, and we'll do this together, and I'll say amen, and we'll move into, into the teaching. So let's start now. So baptism, um, we'll begin in the, in the New Testament. I looked around for the origins of baptism predating the New Testament um, or how other cultures and religions have approached this practice. And it is actually pretty novel to Christianity. Um, and it finds its roots in who? Yeah, John, right? John the Baptist, John the Baptizer. He did baptisms, made it into his, like, name there. Um, and the scriptures have, uh, he's kind of a wild character. I don't know how familiar you are with him. It seemed to like, in all the Gospels, the writers seem to go out of their way to describe how unusual of a man this guy was. He emerged from the wilderness. Most likely he was hanging out with the Essenes, this, this um, group of very like almost strict legalistic Jews who had completely withdrawn from culture and were living out in the wilderness in the desert. Um, well, John emerges from the wilderness, and he's wearing an outfit made of camel hair, which apparently was unusual at the time, unusual enough to get mentioned. Uh, and he was subsisting on a diet that uh, was locusts and honey, right? You guys ever eaten a bug? No? Absolutely. Not on purpose? <laughs> yeah. One time I was in Cambodia, and it's pretty common there. Um, They'll just have these like flash fried cockroaches in bags, and they, people eat them like they're little snack crackers. Yeah, they're all over the place. At least I worked 20 years ago when I was there. And after being there for months and months and seeing people just snacking on these bad boys, one day I thought, I can eat a cockroach. They can eat a cockroach. I can eat a cockroach. It's all in your head. It's probably just salty. And so I threw the thing in my mouth and I was chewing on it, and I was doing okay. It was just like a little salty snack, kind of like a sunflower seed, but then it's little, it's little feelers, you know, these things. Kind of like got caught on my lip, one part of it. Realized what I was eating, and uh, that was pretty gross. So I just did that once. John apparently was eating these kind of things, like as his primary means of protein. Um, but this man John emerges. He emerges from the wilderness around Judea, and what he's carrying is this urgent message. He keeps talking about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. It's imminent. It's upon us. And what he makes clear is that preparations have to be made. That if there's a desire within you to be able to recognize the Lord and to receive, it's like the lens needs to be clean. You know, the glasses, the, the, there's, there's something that is adding an extra layer of challenge to being able to recognize and receive the very thing that we long most for. This is the message. And so he says, repent. Repent of your sins and be baptized. This is 
his message. And people begin to say that, hey, maybe this guy's like this fulfillment of this old prophecy a long time ago. And the Hebrew scripture is this book of Isaiah prophesies that God says, I will send my messenger ahead of you and he will prepare your way. He's a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths. Level the paths. Level the playing field. Remove the barriers. Remove the blockades. Clean the lens that you might see. And even though such a wild man snacking on bugs and such, thousands of people are responding to his message. These crowd, he's drawing crowds. And um, not only are they responding to the words that he's speaking, but they're responding to this invitation to be immersed in the Jordan River, to be dunked fully. And um, one person who responds is his, his cousin, uh, Jesus. Um, and so this miracle is happening. People are being baptized in the Jordan River and the flowing waters, and it's the beginning of this initiation rite that would come to be known as, as baptism. It seems pretty novel to Christianity. There are hints of it within John's uh, tradition. There's really nothing new under the sun. I'm not sure. I spent you know, most of my 20s trying to be original. Um, and then begrudgingly through my 30s realized that you, there's, there's, you can't really be original. It's all been said. Um, C.S. Lewis has this great line that, that as soon as you stop trying to be original, you, you, you find your voice. And so even here with this, with this rite, this, um, this immersion, this baptism, there, there are hints of it within John's um, tradition. In the Hebrew scriptures, there's this process of ritual purification. It's called the mikvah. And what it is, it's a bathing in fresh, clean water. It's re- it was required for priests, even in their desert wandering. When the, when the uh, Hebrew people had been liberated from Egypt, they're out wandering in the desert. They made this tabernacle, this tent. And the tent was said to house the presence of God. And before the priests, only a priest were allowed in there. But before they went in, they had to undergo a process, a full body purification. And clean water, and running water, if you can find it, and living water. Right? This, this is stated over and over again, living water, if you can find it. If you can't find living water, there are a couple other options, A, you know, B, C, D, and E, um, to enter the tabernacle. It was also the only way, this mikvah, to be bathed in clean water, was the only way to become ritually clean again if you had become ritually unclean. By There's a few different ways that could happen. Uh, and when the temple was built, finally, when the Hebrew people had a home, um, they built this magnificent temple, and it was necessary for everybody, and no matter who you were, what, what class of citizen, uh, that you be ritually clean, this mikvah, before you enter the temple. And so it's the same idea. It's this, it's this process of purification that must occur in order that we become able to recognize the, the presence of God in our midst, this thing that we have been made from and for, the place of our, our deepest longing and fulfillment. There's some kind of cleaning up that has to happen for us to see and so for, for John and for his original audience, part of the way I think they were responding so profoundly to his message is because there was some um, programming in there, this idea of mikvah, um, which is the representation is that of purification and also a, a change in status to have gone from unclean to, to clean, from sort of barred from entry to allowed in. There's a change in status. Mikvah, I, I really like words. Um, maybe you've noticed. Mikvah, it's a Hebrew word. It means ritual bath. That's what it's come to mean. Its literal translation in English is collected waters, where waters are gathered. There's four letters in the word mikvah. The first letter means place. That's that collection, the place where the collection is happening. And the last three letters produce a verb, kava. And this verb means connection, collection, or entanglement. So to be, to be baptized, if we just take the word apart, we see the intent of this word is to help us see that to be baptized is to gather oneself in the place of entanglement with God. That 
that we might be collected in this meeting place of our life. The reality, actual reality is revealed. That there is no separation between us and God. And that there is an entanglement that is so profound and deep that we couldn't run away from it if we tried. We can blind ourselves to it. We can be unaware of it. But that doesn't change reality. That same word kava, that connection, entanglement, collection, that's, that's literal translation. It's also the Hebrew word for hope. Isn't that interesting? It's the same word for hope. It means to gather or to collect. Kav, the, the, the literal meaning, that entanglement, it, it means to bind or to twist. That would be the same word that's used to describe like making rope. A few strands of separate things that have been twisted together in such a way that they're one. It's one new thing. So you can think of it in terms of uh, it's like twisting together into rope or yarn being knitted together into a cloth. I think a beautiful picture of it is, is like a river flowing into an ocean. You know, once the river meets the ocean, who can say which droplet of water is river and which droplet of water is is ocean? What what happens there? Is it one or is it two? This is what baptism represents. It's this co-mingling, this this willing surrender to a mystery that's too deep to really put words to. And and it's one of the, the beauties of the sacraments is that they're meant to be experienced with our body, the the Eucharist. We eat it, we chew it. Our body is engaged. Baptism, our body is engaged. It's it's mysteries that are beyond the world of words. They have to be experienced from the inside. There's this very old manuscript um, called the Didache, and some historians say it predates the Gospels, written in the first century, um, which is a very interesting time period. I'm sort of fascinated with early church history because thousands, if not millions, of people are being baptized. They're repenting of their sins. They're being baptized and stating their desire to follow uh, in this way. Uh, But this is before there was ever any kind of canonized Bible. There was no sort of church that you could go, and it it was just happening. And it was happening so fast that I, my imagination goes to, I wonder, what was the understanding of these folks? It was like the response was coming from somewhere deeper than here. Um, and so there's this manuscript, the, the Didache, and it's interesting. It's like, a, um, it's like a how-to manual for organizing a church. It was like the first attempt at like, all right, we can't quite tell what's going on here, but somebody's got to like, you know. And it has a little passage concerning baptism that says, um, it says, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in living water. Over and over again, it's like the, the primary way for baptism to occur is in water that is flowing or living. And why do you suppose that is? Yeah, they didn't have the kind of, I guess, the convenience of baptismal tubs. You know, mostly running water. Do you guys hear this thing that sounds like a train every now and then that happens over here on this wall? That's like, I think there's air in the pipes of our plumbing. I'm not sure if you're a plumber. Come talk to me later. Um, So that isn't a train approaching from over here or like the Mayport Ferry leaving. That's like air in the pipes. Um, But we got, yeah, that's right. We we can kind of make our own pools. What, What else is the nature of like, did your mom ever tell you not to play in puddles after it rained? No, she didn't. Mine, mine used to. I remember a couple hurricanes and the whole street would be flooded, and I don't want to go out there and splash around in it. My mom was all worried about, like, you know, ringworm. Yeah. What happens when water isn't alligators? <laughs> There's alligators in the sewers. 
We were from Chicago. We didn't know what was going on down here. <laughs> what happens if water isn't moving? It stagnates. What happens when water stagnates? Yeah, right. Um, is that any different than life? Like, than your life and mine? It's interesting, at least, to observe the fact that in most, I think for most of us, like, one of the scariest things there is is change. There's some part of us that spends the bulk of our energy, whether we're paying attention to it or not, the bulk of our energy is spent in preserving some kind of a status quo, some sense of, of stability, and that's obviously helpful. Um, Let me, ask, let me ask this, too. If you think about baptism and what happens as you like observe it or as you've experienced it, what is the symbolism of being lowered into the water, it's living water, it's moving water, and then being brought up out of it again? What, what, is, what do you suppose this means? What does it represent? From death... To life, right? You go from the, the living position, right? It's a, it appears to be a living person approaching the other guy in the water, right? and then lowered into the water, much like the grave, and up alive. And I want to talk about baptism here for, for just a minute um, through the lens um, that I found helpful, and it's it's through the lens of Have you heard of this thing that the hero's journey? sometimes called the hero's journey, um, or the journey, some folks call it. Uh, there's a guy named Joseph Campbell who was a professor and a writer, and he wrote extensively on this in the 1950s and the 1960s, the hero's journey, and what he called it was the central human myth, like the primary meaning-making story. And what he discovered in his research is that across cultures, through millennia, people have been telling stories that follow this same narrative arc. Uh, he, he's, he, one time he called it the, the hero with a thousand faces. And so he kind of brought to the, um, the broader population this, this idea, this um, recognition of this central meaning-making myth. And then somebody observed it, was almost like a student of his, and employed it to make one of maybe the most famous movie of all time, Star Wars. Um, he told this story of Luke Skywalker around the idea of the hero's journey. He used that. And it's pretty much become the template for Hollywood since then. Um, 70s, 80s, 90s. I mean, think of all the movies that tell a very similar, similar story. Um, so I want to look at the sort of stages of, of the hero's journey. And I want to look at it through the lens of initiation, um, baptism what we might be talking about here. So stage one is separation. Um, stage one has to do with the, the ordinary world, the status quo. It's like reality as you always knew it. It's the water that we all swim in. There's that little parable where the two young fish are swimming in the ocean and this older fish swims by. The older fish says to the young fish, morning boys, how's the water? And they kind of look at him funny and swim on. When they get out of earshot, one of the young fish says to the other one, what is water? It's like you don't know it's there until somebody shows you it's there. Or until you start to notice that the ways that the world has been explained to you, the sort of foundational, foolproof truths, uh, they can't stand up to some scrutiny. Some experience happens and it just like punctures your worldview. There's a famous word right now, like deconstruction. People talk about people deconstructing their faith. And I think that's like an okay analogy because I, I can't think of a better one. But my problem with that word deconstruction is that I, me personally and most of the folks I've met, deconstruction sounds like you kind of like surveyed the building and you're like, I don't think it can be saved. And then you brick by brick take it apart in order to build something new on top of it. That's not what it feels like on the inside, is it? 
It's that somebody just a few weeks ago described it to me like this. It's like their worldview is this beautiful ball, string, and they loved it. And they would periodically kind of pull one string out and just examine it and appreciate it for its individuality and also for the way that it was part of this, this whole thing. And then they said one day they pulled one string out and the whole ball unraveled. The stated goal was not to unravel the ball of string. It just fell apart. And the immediate response to the unraveling wasn't happiness. Thank goodness I'm free of that old way of seeing things. It was sort of like, oh, no. Now what? That, that period there, that, that, that movement from ordinary world, the status quo, Life as we've always understood it. Um, into the second phase, which is um, the initiation or the ordeal. Um, that movement there is often uh, an uninvited one. And um, I want to talk about it in, in a couple different ways. This is kind of like, in the ordinary world, it's the status quo. And the way that we um, understand who we are is like, you know, growth is incremental. We grow a little bit at a time. Um, what's valued highest is productivity. Like, you know, we've got to kind of figure out who we are and how we fit and then how we can contribute to, to the world, help make it a better place. Um, and kind of undergirding that whole model is this idea of self-preservation. You know, we've got to find a model that works, find how we fit in it, and then we've got to protect it. We've got to keep it, keep it healthy and, and moving. And it's the world of accomplishments, and it's the world of doing, and it's where most of the world lives most of the time. Um, but when we experience something like this ball of thread thing, when something comes through that is maybe unexpected and can't be sustained by the previous model, it can feel terrifying because who likes change? But, it, but again, here's this feeling that the, the only way to be like healthy in this life It comes through change, and it comes through the challenges that change presents. This is how Jesus said it. He said, look, I tell you the truth. You can't see the kingdom. You can't recognize. It's a recognition event that is impossible unless you're born again, to be born again. I, I've never given birth. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I was born I, wasn't, I can't really remember it. Um, uh, but I have been present in, in, in the room where this happens. And I, I can tell you, it, it, it appears to be a relatively painful experience. <laughs> and like, even with doctors and medicine and all the assuredness that comes from that, I mean, it really feels like I don't know if any of us are going to make it out alive. <laughs> You must be born again, right? So this is the initiation or, or the ordeal. It's called sometimes the call to action. It's like the ordinary world is maybe not quite what you thought it was. Um, you may not have, be filled with the desire to leave it. You can see that there might be something happening um, beyond it or underneath it. A special world is hinted at. And there comes an invitation, and what happens is it's often resisted for a very long time. And the reason that we resist responding to the call to action is because we sense, right, the part of us that wants to stay alive can sense the magnitude of this decision. Like, this is going to be a big disruption. This isn't going to be a nice addition to my mostly good life. Like, this might, I might die. So maybe let's not do that. This story's told over and over again, like the Lord of the Rings. You guys like the Lord of the Rings? Like, you know, there's Frodo. All he wants to do is stay in the Shire. It's safe. It's nice. He's got six or seven meals he eats a day. You know, he's got that, you know, the hobbits have that real, like, strict um, sort of comfort model. And then Gandalf appears, and here comes the call to adventure. And what happens is Frodo resists it. He's like, well, no, I'm not. I'm just, like, I'm just a little guy. Why don't you go do it? And Gandalf's like, oh, if I do it, I'll, I'll turn into a demon. Actually, you have to do it. I can't do it. You have to do it. And 
it's all over the scriptures too. You know, the same thing happens to Moses. Remember, he's out and he's in the normal world. It's Midian, he's just a, taking care of his sheep in the wilderness. And suddenly there's this bush it's burning and it's not consumed. And when he approaches it, this voice comes to him. And the voice of God tells him to go and do something. And Moses is, it's interesting because what the voice does is tell Moses to go do the thing that he wanted to do on his own before he got stuck in Midian to, to set his people free. But after this long period in the desert, Moses is so sort of broken down that when God tells him to go and do this thing, he's like, I can't do it. Send, send my brother. He's, he's better with words. Send him. He can take care of it. But God won't do it. God is persistent. It's, it's, it's you. You have to go. Nobody can do it for you. And so, eventually, you know, we leave, don't we? We set out on this journey unsure of where it's even leading. We can just tell that where we were, um, it doesn't quite feel like home anymore. I had, a, I had a teacher one time who told me that when they were trying to settle the new world, uh, ships from Spain and were also coming over, and everybody went home. All the adventurers would, would eventually go home, the, the malaria and the, you know, People who already lived here that didn't want them to live here too. I guess. Like, you know, there was lots of trials and it was hot. Um, and they would go home and eventually one of these guys set fire to the ships. They made it here and he burned all their ships. And this, my teacher friend, he's Australian, he used to say, Burn your ships, mate. That's what he would tell us to do. Like, as long as there's the temptation or the thought of an escape, we're not fully committed to, to what's happening now. And there comes a time when we realize there, there is no going home. We, it, 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 we're not sure where we're going. We don't know that we even like where we are. It's lively. It's adventurous. It's different. There's this recognition that there is no, there's no going back. And this is faith, I think. I think faith is the acceptance of what's yet to be known. And faith is are choosing to surrender, in, to surrender ourselves to the circumstances of our life as they actually are. You see that? And what happens through this journey is that we kind of had a sense that it was going to be hard at the beginning, and then it turned out to be, like, a lot harder than we thought it was going to be. You see? There's life, there's this magnitude of life, this increase in our experience of what it is to be alive. But at the same time as, as, as we experience this, we're, we're also having to deal with betrayals we would have never expected, relationships dissolving and breaking apart. You know, it's weird. We're resistant to change, but when we begin to change, you know who's really uncomfortable? The, the people closest to us. It, you know, it's kind of like we have this weird... We have this weird unspoken agreement all with each other that we're like, all right, you're you and I'm me. And so as long as you keep being you, that means I'm me. And so if you start changing, that makes me start to ask who I really am, and that doesn't feel very good. So then I say, you shouldn't be changing. I'm not sure if this is a good idea. <laughs> so some relationships fall apart, but then we're also surprised by uh, the support that rises to meet us where we are. Maybe people we would never expect come alongside. I have been so, so blessed this season. So blessed by so many of you and so surprised at some of the places where the blessings came. There was a guy that showed up around here like six months ago. And I gotta tell you, I was at my like lowest. I was freaking out. <laughs> I was freaking out. And this guy shows up, and I typecast him. I'm like, oh, no, what does this guy want? I thought he you know, was going to ask for something, and I felt like I don't even have the energy to hand you a can of soup from that shelf, man. Like, I, you know, that, it's not cool of me, but that's how I felt. And we got to talking, and he's like, you got a broom? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, let me sleep off this walk for you here. And... I was like, I can't pay you. This is where I'm at, jaded. I, don't have, I can't pay you. And he's like, I didn't ask you for money. I asked you for a broom. 
So I gave him a broom, and he slept the walk, and he came back the next day. And over the course of, a, like, I don't know, two weeks, this guy just spoke these words of life in, into me. He, like, prophesied over me. He, he told me the kind of things that I needed to hear when I needed to hear them. And I spent this whole, it's the weirdest thing. Have you been through this? Like, it's like you're almost resistant to receiving from the places that you're receiving because they're not the places that you expect. And so you want the places where you aren't receiving the encouragement to start encouraging you. <laughs> it's this weird game. It's a weird game. And eventually, you know, for me, I just got tired of resisting. I didn't have enough juice left to resist anymore. And so I just started to, to receive grace wherever wherever it would come from. Um, and this really does break down some of those categories that we get trapped in, you know, where it's like these are the people that are good to me and those are the ones that I can't trust. And then you start to see, like, hold on a second. <laughs> like, it's, we're all a mixed bag. Um, wh- what happens here in, in the initiation and in, in the ordeal is oftentimes the hero begins to, like, make ground, right? Luke learns the force uh, Frodo sees some victories with his friends, and then and then the bottom actually falls out. You know, Luke Luke has his hand lopped off, and then <laughs> the guy who just chopped his hand off tells him that he's his father. Remember this? And and uh, Mark Hamill lets loose with the greatest expression in the history of motion pictures about this information. Frodo's cocooned by a monstrous spider. It looks like he's dead. Neo is brought lifeless into the machine city. Harry's killed in the forest by Voldemort. Jesus hangs on the cross. It's over. And this moment, the lowest point, this moment is the death that precedes resurrection. And we can't separate the two. There's no resurrection without death without something that actually feels like the end. And this is what's represented in the going beneath the waters of baptism, is this death that precedes resurrection and this acknowledgement that we can't circumvent death, that even death we have to learn to make peace with, to allow it. This is St. Paul. He says, I want to know Christ. I want to know it. I want to experience Christ to know the power of his his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, to become like him in his death, and in this somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. Can't separate the two. This is my question. Um, What really dies? What is it that actually dies? Yeah. The the ego. And what's that? How do we, (laughs) what's that? Let's just nail that down real quick. Your self-will, that's good. Yeah, this idea that I can will my way, that's it, right? I set off on the journey. I think maybe I can actually get there. Me, the self-will. The false self. What dies is the idea of who it, who it is that I think that I am. But I work so hard on it. And if I'm not that, what am I? And the reality of it is, we, this is um, the revelation, the answer to that refuses to reveal itself until we surrender ourselves to, the, to this process of, of, of death, of letting go. Jesus said it like this I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. And what we begin to experience is we can't make it there. The, 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 the part of us that was so scared to begin the journey and maybe gained a little confidence along the way realizes it can't go the distance. And in experiencing that death, what begins to present itself is that the same one who called us, God, who created us, who placed us here, who who guides us, knowingly or unknowingly, the same one who called us out is also here within and 
carries us to places we could never make it on our own. I think this is, this is Joseph Campbell. He says this, people say that what we're all seeking is a meaning for life. What's the meaning of life? I don't think that, we're, that that's what we're actually seeking. I think that what we're seeking is an experience of being alive so that our life experiences on the purely physical plane will have resonances within our own innermost being and reality so that we actually feel the rapture of being alive. We begin to experience that we're not actually here to make sense out of life. The old grid's gone. We don't have to rush to make a new one. We don't have to master life. We're here to experience what it is to be alive and to learn how to love. And that is where the story ends. It's that T.S. Eliot has this great line. He says, um, it's something along the lines of, after all of our searching, after all of our seeking, what we end up is we return to the place where we started, but we see it for the first time. And this is the end of the cycle. It's the return. It's this experience of union. It's the realization that what I was searching for was with me all along. That, it, that God isn't out here or over there. The meaning or purpose of my life isn't in the next phase or the next phase. It's in the now. And that when I feel my weakest, I'm actually filled with life and filled with gifts to share. But the sharing feels so different because the categories have dissolved so much where it doesn't feel anymore like I'm the one with something to offer the person who needs something. It's that all the, the giver, the receiver, it, there's this experience of, of, of union. There's no more hierarchies. And this, I think we could call this freedom. Freedom. And I'll close with this statement. This is, as far as I can read it in the scriptures, this seems to be what Paul is talking about, that this, this scriptural understanding of, of baptism. It's that there's been a change of status from the separate individual to part of a community, part of a local community, but also even deeper than that, the recognition of being part of and therefore one with all of it. Paul said it like this, 1 Corinthians 12. He's like, you were baptized. You were baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. Whether you're this religion or that religion, whether you're this status or that status, we were all baptized in one spirit. We were all given one spirit to drink, to live on. Yeah. And so, um, so we'll, we'll conclude there. And we'll just conclude with the invitation. You know, I, you know how many times I've been baptized? Six, I think. I used to think something was wrong with me. You know, I thought, which one of those took? I wonder, like, <laughs> what, <laughs> what is this compulsion for, for baptism? But more and more, I just I experience life as these as these cycles, you know. It's like I wish there was a once and for all. You're done. I have not experienced life in this way. Um, there are moments of surrender that are profound, but then there's a reality that every single moment presents the opportunity for surrender. Every moment is the threshold. And if you sense yourself to be in one of those deeper places of being let out from what is most familiar and this desire to surrender yourself into the presence of God in a deeper way, um, then, and you feel baptism might be helpful, a helpful outward expression of that reality, we would love to be a part of that. So, um, yeah, so that's it for this morning. We've got just a few minutes left. Katie, if you want to come up. Um, you know, we'll hold the space here together for, we've got eight minutes. You, uh, service is officially over, so if you're getting kind of fidgety, you're, you're welcome to leave. Um, you're also welcome to stay. And just 
give space for reflection just within your own self. What did you hear? What did you notice? What, did you, what are you responding to? And if you just take that noticing and offer it as a prayer. You're welcome to stay as long as you want. The table will be open. Um, there's wine and juice. They're clearly labeled. Um, and that's open for anybody who feels that that might be an appropriate response.